Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The church needs many more young men and women to respond to God's call. I'm Father Michael Sparrow from the Bellarmine Jesuit Retreat House. One of the priests highlighted on Vocari, Shalom World's weekly television show that highlights the diversity of men and women who have responded to God's call to priesthood and religious life. We count on your prayers and your generous gifts to help us continue to produce Vokari and a wide variety of other television inspirational shows seen around the globe for the glory of God. No gift is too small, no gift is too large. Support Shalom World TV, and the next time you tune in, you'll be glad you did. My vocational story is uh, much like so many other guys that'll tell you that it's something we never expected, I never expected ever to become a priest, though shortly after high school, everyone's always talking to you about the things that you can do to make money in the world and to make a life. Uh, no one ever really talked to me about what it meant to look for vocation in one's life. Well, my name is Father Ezekiel Sanchez, and uh, I'm a native here in Chicago. I was born in the late 60s here in Chicago at uh, St. Elizabeth Hospital. And I've grown here all my life, and uh, my neighborhood was the, uh, the little village neighborhood of Chicago, and it's pretty much where I grew up. My vocational story is uh, much like so many other guys that'll tell you, that it's something we never expected, I never expected ever to become a priest, though I've been a lifelong Catholic. Thanks to my parents, uh, who are from Durango, Mexico, immigrants from that country here. And so my vocational journey really begins a little later because I attended all public schools and public grammar schools, public high schools, and I even started the university training uh, for electronics engineering. At that time, I realized I really didn't have much of a calling for being an engineer, not that I did so bad as much as I didn't feel the passion for it. Shortly after high school, everyone's always talking to you about the things that you can do to make money in the world and to make a life. Uh, no one ever really talked to me about what it meant to look for vocation in one's life. We were always going to Mass on Sunday, and that was pretty much it. Our Catholic life was pretty much like so many Catholic families. We live our Catholic faith in our home, we say our rosaries, and we pray as a family, we do all the Catholic traditions, and, and we help out as best we can. It wasn't until my later years I began to uh, help out at the parish and helping teach CCD and, and help out uh, with other people. I learned that I liked it. I liked it very much to teach children uh, about our faith and other things. And so one of the things I was thinking about was moving to becoming a teacher, changing my career from engineering to becoming a teacher. And so in that process, the, my local parish priest uh, approached me and said, would you think about being a priest? And remember, I'd never had any experience with too many priests in terms of their inner life, or I didn't know anything about seminarians other than what my parents would tell me, that they had lived in Mexico. I didn't see myself in that vein. I didn't see myself as that religious or that pious, but I was a good person trying to do good things. More and more, the pastor kept nagging at me, kept calling me to think about the priesthood in my life. And as I was thinking about changing careers anyway, I thought to myself, well, let me give it a try. If it isn't for me, then I'll know in a year. And so I decided to give the seminary a chance just to try to see where this would lead me. I had no idea exactly what I was doing. I was open to the idea of the priesthood, but I really didn't think I would ever become one. Um, and as I entered the seminary those early years, I entered the college seminary um, and started practically all over from scratch my college uh, background, primarily because the liberal arts uh, curriculum didn't have too much room for a technology curriculum that we had to deal with. And so I had to start all over from scratch. Year after year at being in the seminary, I had to decide whether or not I was going to stay. And the more I stayed, the more involved I began to be in the life and the apostolate of the church. I had very beautiful experience thanks to the seminary. 
I was even able to travel abroad, especially to the Philippines that I fell in love with so deeply because I had a wonderful missionary experience out there. It was after that, once working with the deepest of the poor, that I realized that this is something that I really do love. And listening to the life of the community, the people that I served, especially in my parish, everyone would say, please don't give up, we need you. I said, I'll continue discerning. So I entered Mundelein Seminary, the, the graduate school, and continued the discernment there. It was every year a decision to stay or go, always confiding in the Lord's providence in my life and looking for ways to become ever more deeply honest with myself. Don't pretend something or to live into someone else's expectation, but is this something I wanted to do? The grace of the Spirit was always part of my life, and so prayer and service to others was the hallmark of who I really was. And so when it came time to make the decision, will you be ordained, I did so with trepidation and some fear, primarily because that happens at everybody. When you're going to enter into a new life, you are not sure what that life will hold in front of you. And so as I thought about being a priest, the, all those seven years that I was training for the priesthood, I just kept thinking about one thing, how my family was being impacted. At the time, my father had been uh, diagnosed with a brain form of brain cancer. It was benign, but it was quite large. He suffered for eight years in a hospital. Throughout the entire time I was in school, he was already in the hospital. That whole experience, as I look back upon it, taught me how to look at suffering, helped me how to look at people hurting, especially those you deeply love. Eight years in a hospital would teach you something about grace and redemption. And so when I did get ordained, um, my wonderful spiritual mother, a beautiful nun, whom I cared for very much, once walked up to me and said, the reason why you became a priest because you were living off the graces of your father's suffering. I took that to heart. And it reminded me that human suffering is not useless, but very useful for the kingdom of God. Learning to help those in suffering, learning to help those in their piety, especially those who come from other communities, immigrant communities, or even our own Americans here in the United States, how deeply we need the spiritual experiences of others. Indeed, that's the point of evangelization. The gospel had come to us. It comes to each one of us through the testimony of someone else. Going through those experiences and making decisions about whether or not I wanted to be a priest was always supported by my family. No one ever pushed me to do so. In fact, they even wondered how long will it take for me to step away. But every year that I had decided to stay, they were more and more supportive. Early on, it wasn't easy because it was very difficult even for them to understand. But with good mentorship, hard work, and above all, good friends that you develop as you grow up as a student, you have wonderful friendships in seminary, and now I have wonderful friendships in the priesthood. We're brothers working together to serve our communities and our families in terms of the parishes we are given. I look back on those wonderful years and how I felt about it. There was never a single decision that was easy, but all of them were grace-filled. I love being a priest, and it's a something I, if I were to do again, I'd do it exactly the same. My first question to you is, you've been a priest for the past 22 years. Tell us about your positions in the different churches you've been assigned at. Well, I've been assigned to a lot of things lately. Um, when I was first ordained, I was assigned to an interesting church. It was called Our Lady of Grace. Now, the reason why I was an interesting church in assignment was primarily because when I was studying for the priesthood, one of the things I was preparing for uh, was to do Hispanic ministry, and specifically Mexican ministry. That's what I understood Hispanic ministry was at the time. Remember, I was born and raised here. And so I didn't have an awful lot more contact with other brothers and sisters from Latin American countries. So I had to learn about those as I go around. So uh, Our Lady of Grace wasn't Mexican, it was Puerto Rican. And so I had to go through an entire conversion process to learn the Puerto Rican culture, the Central American culture, and the language. We, although we speak Spanish, it's a different kind of Spanish. There's different words, there's cultural differences that I had to learn that no one had, to, that I had to learn as we go along the way. So it was a wonderful experience to open me up to the diversity of our Catholic faith, as even within the Spanish-speaking world. I had to learn to speak Spanish better. See, because when you're an American or you're someone from another culture speaking Spanish, they'll forgive you for all kinds of things. 
nobody forgives me because <laughs> I'm from that culture. Um, so I had to learn Spanish uh, really well to be able to publicly speak in it, to write in Spanish properly, to be able to communicate properly and educatedly because I'm supposed to be one of the more educated members of their, of their community. So I lasted three marvelous years there with my pastor, Father Tom Tyvee. And he taught me just a wonderful way. He was an Irish priest, so you imagine. So I learned how to be an Irish priest in a Puerto Rican community being a Mexican priest. So it's been <laughs> so there was a lot of diversity right from the beginning. Uh, I was only there for three years, though. Um, Cardinal George uh, then called me to become the director for Hispanic ministry in the archdiocese. So you can imagine that was. So I went from being associate priest in a, in a parish in Chicago to becoming now the head of this entire ministry that was at that time almost 30, 35% of the Catholic world in the diocese back in those days. And so we were beginning to develop networks and talking to people and helping the diocese understand the community and helping the community take a better leadership role and responsibility for the needs of the church. Um, I was then assigned to Holy Trinity Croatian uh, while I was still director, I'm sorry. And uh, that was a trilingual community. So it was a Croatian community in the, in the largely Mexican community uh, where we spoke English, Spanish, and Croatian. So being a pastor of a trilingual community, I, it was always a challenge, but I welcomed it because I, I had already learned how to immerse myself in the life of a community I didn't know and how to allow myself to be known to the different people I have to minister to. So after that, I was moved to Cicero uh, and there I was pastor of uh, Mary Queen of Heaven in Cicero. And that was a very blighted church. The church was, you got nails coming out of the kneelers, uh, everything was falling apart. The place was in massive debt. It was, from what I understand, it was about a month away from being decided to be closed. But the archbishop said, see what you can do there. Uh, I didn't know if I had to close the place or if, what we had to do. But to make a long story short, I challenged the community. I had enough experience to challenge the community to, to, to gather it and say, what do we want to do? And they decided to save their church. And they did to this day, it, it operates. So I spent uh, six years there. We revitalized the parish, we revitalized the neighborhood. And it's alive and working now. It's do, doing very, very well. Thank you. A church that was going to be closed, we were able to save it. Uh, I took a, a sabbatical after that. Um, I was, ex I was except all these things when you have to raise something that's blighted or broken or you've never done something, that, that takes a lot out of you. Uh, so I took a sabbatical. I was having a hard time. Um, yeah, and so uh, it was an important sabbatical to take because I didn't know where, what direction my life was going. I just didn't want to go on fixing broken churches. Uh, but when I decided to come back, I came back to Chicago. Um, and I was made pastor of uh, St. Bede the Venerable Church. And there was my first parish where I had a Catholic school. And I had some ideas about how to manage a Catholic school because I've always wanted to get, have my hand at administrating how do I transform a Catholic school and make it into a more successful venture in ministry for the church. Um, we were very successful. I was only there four years. Uh, after my fourth year, I got the phone call from uh, Archbishop Supich to become now the rector of the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which I've been here for about a year, year and a half now. The sad part of the, the uh, educational system in Chicago back in those years, again, not to slam it, but it was the reality that we were going through it. There were so many you kept being pushed out. Whether or not you were skilled, uh, promoted, more you were more promoted because there was too many behind you to, and they needed that desk. Um, it, it wasn't until I got into seminary with my first Catholic school that I realized how badly formed I was, how little education I really had. And so I had to learn all over again how to do all those things. And I thank, I thank God for the, for, the, for the seminary. And if everyone asks me, why did I become, what's the one thing that drives me about being a priest? And I think about it, and the only thing that comes to the back of my mind is I'm very grateful to the church. The church saved me. Uh, and I can say that very clearly because in all those years of hard hardships, the church was there for my family. The church was there for us. It, it, not that we got clothes or food or anything like that, but we were there because we went to a church where the priest spoke to us. They knew our names. 
We, we went to church on Sunday because we would find our uncles and our aunts and our cousins there. We were a community. When I walked into the seminary and the kindness of my tutors uh, wanting me to be successful, I never had experience that someone wanted to give that much time that wanted me to become successful in whatever it is I do. We were just trying to make it. That was the mentality of what we had back then. To move from just making it to contributing is uh, it's a gigantic leap. And I attribute it to church for giving me that. We thank the church for everything it provided for us, everything that inspired us, uh, everything it taught us. And the, the major minister of that church was my mother. This is a place of intense prayer. This is what I, I, when I describe people what the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe is, it's a place of intensity. Nobody, you know, everybody comes here with some intense need, whether it's an immigrant who is going to be facing a judge um, uh, and scared out of his mind that I'm gonna be deported, whether it's someone who's going to be facing the judge of a doctor who's gonna tell them what the test results are, uh, whether it's someone who's going to go through surgery to, and whether it's someone who's lost a job. There's some intensity going on here. People come here because life has gotten really intense. And so we come here to uh, express our needs and sorrows and our hopes that there's somebody in heaven listening to us and really is uh, an expression both of love and of, of need. So you get a lot of people that literally come here for for all kinds of needs and petitions that come to, to Our Lady. And, uh, and the intensity of their piety only shows the intensity of their concern. So I, give you, I gave you the example we had last, uh, last uh, December 12th, a gentleman who walked eight, mile, walked eight miles on his knees um, to get to the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So when he got here, his knees were just shot, bloodied. Uh, they were just horrible. And you look at this, to anyone else's eyes, they're like, this is just fanaticism to the extreme. But if you look at him, pay attention to him, who was he, what was he doing? Then when you asked him, why did you do that? And his answer was, because my daughter's in the hospital and I want Our Lady to perform a miracle for my daughter. I want to show how much I care about her. So fanaticism is someone who demands others have the same fanaticism you do. But if you're the one doing it as an expression of your faith, an expression of your love and the intensity of what you're concerned about, that's not fanaticism. That, that's, that's an intensity of love that needs to be listened to and, expect, and respected. And so as I listened to him, this is exactly what he was experiencing. But the fact he fulfilled his promise, he was both filled with great pain because his physical body was breaking on him, but his emotional property was elated. He was so happy, happy laughing. Did you ever have the experience of both laughing and crying at the same time? Well, that's what he was going through. We called the ambulance for him and he had to be taken care of. But when you look at something like that, you can say, that's extreme. But my response to it is, what's extreme was his intense love and concern for the health and well-being of his daughter. That was just a sign of what was happening inside of him. And so as rector of the Shrine of Our Lady Guadalupe, all I do is welcome it. I don't judge it. I don't tell you what to do in that regard. This is your communication with Our Lady. This is your communication with God uh, through Our Lady. And people have a, an amazing and intense trust in Our Lady. They can have problems with trusting individuals, the boss, the church, the pastor, the bishop, anybody. But people have just an amazing trust in Our Lady Guadalupe and Our Lady uh, just in general. That brings them back into the, and it corrects us pastors. It should correct us in the way we need to see um, the children of God. Father, what are the joys of a priest? Because people always see priests as busy, or it's either busy or boring. Tell them about the joys of the priesthood. Uh, we have fun all the time. I, I always tell, I always encourage uh, my young seminarians to say, it's a crime to have as much fun as we do. Uh, we have so much fun. How many bank presidents, CEOs, or company presidents would love to have 
6,000 people listening to your every word every week. I mean, that's just, that's an amazing opportunity just right there. Uh, I love baptisms. I love you, you, the engagement of the families, the engagement of the couples, how to prepare them and joyfully do it. Have fun with it. Tell a story, tell a joke. That's what helps people learn from you because you're breaking down the barriers. So one of my challenges, and I always say this to, to priests, it's not that you have to tell jokes up there. You're not supposed to be a comedian, comedy in, at the Mass. But you have to be accessible, that you have to listen to them in a way. And it's about life. I love families. Uh, what I love is when families come to the shrine, it, whether they're little kids, oh, we're constantly making fun of them. Oh, that haircut doesn't look good for you. Oh, this, I love that little dress, sweetheart. You look like a princess. And just seeing their eyes open up because fathers talk, talk to me, father said something, or listening to people's woes. You're like, they feel better after they talk to you. They went to confession. How are you doing? Pick it up. You're not that bad. Keep it, come on, keep going. Um, you're encouraging people. You're like the coach of this big team. I like to meet the coach that is in part of a professional football team and doesn't have fun. And so I always tell a priest, you got to be their coach. When you come, when they come to mass, they come in broken. They're coming in, you know, they didn't do so good. Or some of them might be doing just fine. But you as the coach got to tell them, you're a team now. Remember, we work together. And so when we get done here, we're going to rah, rah, rah. The Lord is in our life. Now get back out there and do that work God needs you to do. Well, people walk out of here totally with a different mindset. There's somebody to us. Um, Father Tybee, my first pastor, taught me an awful lot. And I use him as a, as a great example. He taught me the, the tradition of the uh, old Irish Catholic priest. In gen uh, a generation or two before us, uh, Irish Catholics, like so many other Catholics, were treated very badly. They took the worst jobs. They had difficult times, like every immigrant does. Um, but at least they had a priest on Sunday that when they went to Mass on Sunday, they were going to go see Father. And Father's major task, so whether you work at the stockyards or whether you work in sewer lines, whether you were a police officer, whatever. You, being a police officer was the worst job you can get. That was dangerous. But Father was there to remind you you're somebody. And so that's what the Irish priest missionaries would do. They would tell you you're somebody. They would make groups, they would make all kinds of things, but they would make you feel like you're somebody in the midst of a difficult situation in life. And I would study that. And I said, well, that's exactly what we need today. That's what this community needs from me. So I'm the Mexican Irish pastor that they had that sees the brokenness of the community that comes. And my primary job is to tell people, you're somebody. You're somebody to us, and we love you. We love you. Don't forget, we love you too. More than solving every social political problem in the world. I think just being told that you you're loved, are you're somebody to me. loved and you have a purpose in life changes and we somebody's know you. life. And we know you, we care about you. Yes. I may not know your per name individually, mm -hmm. but I know as long as you're a member of this church, you're loved. Because you're one of us, you're one of ours. You're baptized. That counts for something. You're a member of the church. And the more we take that into our own lives, especially uh, me as a priest, the clerics, that's our primary task, is to strengthen the community. And what strengthens them the more, then there's someone to, that listens to me, that encourages me, that blesses me, sanctifies me, forgives me, and sends me out again. You see, that, that if I can do that, that's the role of us. As I mentioned before, one of the biggest compliments I get here in the, at the shrine is after meeting me and the other priests that we have, the biggest compliment is always someone will ask, who's in charge here? If you don't know, I'm doing my job. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want you to know because it's not about being in charge. It's about whoever you are, you're somebody to us. And that's the experience I want you to have. My friends, I hope you had a good opportunity to listen to the ministry that we perform here at the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe. 
I've been blessed in so many ways for the past 22 years to be a priest of our Lord Jesus Christ, and I encourage any young man interested in thinking about the calling into the priesthood is, please don't be afraid. The journey is amazing, and the rewards are unimaginable. Most importantly, the reward of feeling fulfilled in doing God's work and in the joy and love of a community. The people love their priests, truly they do. And what more better way to spend your life supporting others, encouraging others for the coming of the kingdom of God. May Almighty God bless you in your discernment. May God help us all and answer the call, the Christ's call to the priesthood. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus said, go out to the whole world and announce the good news. And that's what Shalom is doing. It's bringing the good news of the Holy Spirit in action, renewing the face of the earth so that all people may know how good is the Lord, how beautiful is the work of salvation. Thank you, Shalom, for all you do to reach out, to lead the faith forward, and may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Shalom World, God's own channel.